Very nice to see you guys. Hi, Jonathan Frakes, Star Trek. <laughs> Action! Return to your quarters. Action. It works, though. Okay. All right, children. Cut. Gentlemen. Yes! Cut. Gonna be great. It might help us, because we're gonna have to... Cut. Print. I thought Insurrection, being my second foray into um, making movies, actually was shot with more confidence and uh, a little more style, looked better. They would, we were we were on uh, wonderful locations, but the story wasn't as strong as, as First Contact. So all the um, all the technique and all the use of the and we had wonderful wonderful the weather for it and we had beautiful wheat fields that we worked with a lot of stuff ended up being cut out but the look of the movie i thought was fabulous Scott, Nancy, very nice very nice thank you very much very nice everyone all right it's the most challenging part of it is that you have to find some balance when you're telling a star trek story or a star wars story or a james bond story some balance between the reality that there is a fan base of people who know the history and the mythology of all things Star Trek or all things whatever. And hopefully there's a new audience, an audience of people who are about to be initiated to Star Trek through this movie, through Insurrection, for instance. The, uh, the balance of the two, you need, first of all, to honor the idea of all the myth, all the relationships, the way the ship works, where on what deck is 10 forward as opposed to the sick bay. And if you screw that up, the fans will be on you, the anoraks will be on you like a rash. So you, having done your research and hopefully the, um, the archivists and the people who keep track of all those things are doing the research with you or for you so that you, have, you, don't, you don't screw it up, that's all in place. And the relationships are what they are because we've all played these characters. I mean, we've been together for 15 years, 16 years, something like that. And by the time we did Insurrection, we'd all we'd done 182 hours of television uh, and two movies prior to that. We did Generations and then First Contact. So we were on our third movie as a family. So the relationships, both on camera and off camera, were in uh, were pretty detailed, pretty complex, and worked very well. Action. Commander, I'm showing two sonar. The odd thing about working as a director and as an actor is obviously that on certain days you're calling action and you're wearing a spacesuit and you've got too much mousse in your hair and you've got a little bit of makeup on. That alone, that's absurd enough. The advantage of directing and acting on Star Trek is, as I mentioned earlier, we have been together for so many years and our relationships are so. Uh, complex uh -huh. and intricate and intimate and yeah. and there's a great sense of trust on the yeah. on the set yeah. so that when I'm playing Riker and directing a scene that Riker's in not only do I feel comfortable with the fact that I know my relationship with Marina with um, Troy for instance or with Patrick or with Brent but there are people generally off camera Patrick who's a director LeVar who's a director a wonderful DP Matt Leonetti whose opinion I trust. And Leonetti had the most subtle of all responses always, which I'd, I'd finish a take, and if it was on me, I'd look just subtly over the, my his the actor's shoulder, past the operator, and Leonetti would go, oof, like that. <laughs> Give me one of those. Like, I think maybe we should go for another take. <laughs> it was the short, the, uh, the gentle version of, I hope you can do better than that. <laughs> so he was, uh, he was very, very helpful, like a big brother to me. Action. Commander, I'm showing two sonar ships on an intercept course. How long till they reach us? 18 minutes. We won't be able to get a transmission out of here for at least another hour. They're hailing us. Tell them our transceiver assembly's down. That we can send messages but not receive them. I don't think they believe us. Why not? Shake. Photon torpedo. Isn't that a universal greeting when communications are down? I think it's the universal greeting when you don't like someone. Full impulse. Manifolds can't handle full impulse in the patch, Commander. If we don't outrun them, the manifolds will be the only thing left in this ship. I'll be an engineer. 
Red alert! All hands! Battle stations! There it is. I love doing both. Since I've done a couple of other films where I haven't had to act, I found it almost luxurious to be able to get there in the morning and check your shot sheet and have a cup of coffee with the crew instead of being there an hour before everybody else and uh, thrown into the makeup and hair chairs, which is also nice. The main difference, I'll confide in you, between being an actor and a director is that as an actor, we are pampered. You show up in the morning, someone brings you a cup of coffee. They know exactly what you want for breakfast. They cut the fruit for you. They give you your rye toast. They, um, so the hairdresser is very gentle with you. Somebody has the newspaper for you. You, somebody brings you the lunch at lunchtime. Somebody puts your clothes out for you. You put your costume on. Somebody's always taking care of you, patting your mate. You're so pampered as an actor, which you realize only after you go on and do something else. As a director, you get in your own coffee generally, and all you're doing is answering questions, and nobody cares about how you look. So it's a, um, it's a, it's, it's different. <laughs> Come in. Hi. You got a minute? Sure. I need some counseling. Well, there's a first time for everything. So what? Do I lie down or what? Uh, um, well, whatever makes you comfortable, but uh, this isn't one of the usual therapeutic postures. The uh, actors and the crew, I think, because I was the first guy in the cast One, to get a directing G slot, were, um, they were just loaded for bear. I mean, the, uh, it was merciless, because it's always merciless on our set. Nothing is sacred. No one is sacred. <laughs> and uh, when I was given this opportunity, they were really shameless in their in their behavior or lack thereof. So the same thing came back to haunt Patrick when he directed and Lavar when he directed, and it's uh, and it's been that way ever since. Because of the camaraderie, there's an incredible lack of respect that we show for each other, which reflects itself in a really comfortable jocular, silly working atmosphere. Rerouting the transport grid to avoid detection was wise, sir. However, the transporter is rarely used after 0200 hours. A wonderful scene where Patrick straps on his leather jacket and steals the gun and goes down and is about to abandon ship. And he knew he looked hot. He was so glad to be out of costume. And and the rest of us are all lined up pleading with him to stay. And it was, it was a classic, directly out of Magnificent Seven, where he had decided that he could go alone against the world. And all of us were the voice of reason over his shoulder. And uh, he loved it. We loved it. And it had a strange sense of... Uh, uh, it, it, it reminded a lot of us of, of other things that Picard had done during the series, but this was sort of the, the quintessential version of it, the, the expanded version of it. And I, I just remember the scene, because we staged it, where we all walked down a ramp. It was very sort of Greek. <laughs> we were the chorus, and we descended a ramp, and Patrick was down center with his gun and his leathers. And it was, uh, it had an epic... It was wonderfully directed, wonderfully staged scene. <laughs> Taking the captain's yacht out for a spin. Seven metric tons of ultritium explosives, eight tetrion pulse launchers, and ten isomagnetic disintegrators. Looks like you're planning on doing some hunting. Return to your quarters. That's an order. No uniform, no orders. Captain, how could I look at another sunrise knowing what my sight cost these people? I feel obliged to point out that the environmental anomalies may have stimulated certain rebellious instincts common to youth, which could affect everyone's judgment. Except mine, of course. Okay, Data, what do you think we should do? Saddle up. Lock and load. They won't begin the procedure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's our captain, yeah. I'm sorry, I gotta go change my diapers. <laughs> there was a wonderful uh, uh, gambling pool taken 
on um, whether or not Brent Spiner, who plays Data, would in fact walk into this frozen lake. I, I don't think I can do this, Jerry, without actually seeing Brent go in the water. Uh, I'm not really sure I can find the reaction. It was really bitter, bitter, bitter cold. And the character has to walk down into the lake and obviously he's going to do something to the invisible ship in the And Brento, who is not afraid to let his stuntman do work for him, as I'm not either. We've, we're not the kind of actors say proudly. We always do our own stunts. We both <laughs> have reached middle age and are aware that there are guys getting paid perfectly good money to do this for us. Brent, I said, you know, is there any way that I can get you just to go down a little bit into the water so that I can see that it's actually you and I can be in close on you? And because he's a friend and he's a mensch, he agreed to do it. And uh, they put on uh, a wetsuit underneath his costume and they kept him warm and bundled him up and put heat lamps in front of him and generally coddled him as actors are always coddled. And uh, the morning came and, and Patrick and I said, he's not going to go into the water. He's, not, he's just, he's a chicken. He's not going to go in there. And God bless him, he went all the way into the water, underneath, head underwater, and I covered it from all kinds of angles. <laughs> and in the final cut of the movie, you never see that it's Brent going. It could have, it could have been you or me going into the water. But the truth is, he did it, and God bless him. All right. You know what I'm ready for everything. The, to you. What about the front part? Should I stay just as simple as it is now? Yeah. And also, the timing is great. You guys who have worked this out, the timing of the front end is lovely, the hand in there. No, I don't think you need to... I think you're wrong. You're, um... Because yesterday I was laying some more stuff on it, it seemed like too much. Yeah, it, I think what you're doing now is pretty clear. And F. Murray Abraham, who's a okay, let's wonderful, go. dynamic, wild-eyed well, actor, whose work I think everyone yeah. knows, was the leader of this of this uh, clan of people called the Sona, who had aged so miserably that their skin cracked and was being stretched across their faces, and he was trying to have these bizarre 24th century facelifts, which would which would rekindle his youth, and and he played it to the hilt. So the the uh, the, the makeover chamber where we decided we'd have sort of Bond girls do his. Uh, his facelifts for him. It just became more and more bizarre as as Berman and I added to the absurdity of the the concept of of this man having skin stretched across his face by these beautiful multinational women with with prods and and uh, horrible tools of destruction that and it was a uh, it really became absurd and, the, and it had a Frankenstein element to it that I, I really actually like that part of the movie as much as anything in the movie. Artem, do you remember where you were on the day of lightning when the artificial life form appeared to us? In the hills by the dam. Can you show us? Oh, how annoying was that CG pet. Michael Welch, who played this young boy in the film that befriended Data, had a... Uh, had a pet that he took with him. And we had to obviously find shots that this pet could be animated into his hand or put into his pocket. And, and uh, short of freezing the frame, freezing hundreds of extras. I mean, this had to be, these, this had to be in lines of people who are running up hills and, and exterior shots and losing light and all the, all the business that goes with that. So what we ended up doing was in post-production, we found frames that we could believe perhaps the pet might be worked into. After all these plans we had in pre-production of, oh no, what we'll do is we'll, we'll frame it in such a way so that when we see his hand, we'll be able to, and it, I mean, it was working with a kid, working with an animal that wasn't even real, <laughs> working with computer-generated uh, artists and losing light. All of the, uh, the, it's a perfect example of the best laid plans. <laughs> That's what the CG pet was. <laughs> Artem, what are you doing? Come. It reminds me of one of the gaffers, the guy who does lights, was asked when you're in a cave, we did some stuff in a cave in this movie, they say, where do the lights come from if we're underground in this cave? And he just, without missing a beat, said, same place as the music does. <laughs> just one of my favorite retorts now in movie making. 
it got the same place as the music, he says. Trust us. <laughs> Trust us. <laughs> You're looking well, Jean-Luc. Rested. I won't let you move them, Admiral. I will take this to the Federation Council. I'm acting on orders from the Federation Council. How can there be an order to abandon the Prime Directive? The Prime Directive doesn't apply. These people are not indigenous to this planet. They were never meant to be immortal. We'll simply be restoring them to their natural evolution. Who the hell are we to determine the next course of evolution for this people? Jean-Luc, there are 600 people down there. We'll be able to use the regenerative properties of this radiation to help billions. With all things Star Trek, there's always a morality play the, at, in, at the core or at the end of, of, uh, of all Star Trek stories. In Insurrection, I think the moral, if you will, is that you cannot hold on to your youth no matter how much money or how much power, and nor should you, that, um, that we are only here for We've a certain amount of time, and in that time we, we should enjoy each day as it passes. And I, as always in Star Trek, and I hope in life, the ethics and the morals are uh, against a corrupt lifestyle, against um, racism, which is rampant in this film the the anti-racism message i think is is great uh anti-sexism is is a very important theme and generally the idea that as with all things star trek the the prime directive of of not interfering in others lives sort of echoes the, the golden rule which is the way most of us were brought up which is you know do unto others as you would have them do unto you and that's it always comes back to that on star trek energize for some reason, it's one of those casts, and I know from having guessed it on other television shows, it's not always the case. <laughs> it's one of those casts that actually, as cornball and Pollyanna as it does sound, does work as a family. I mean, we're, we're, um, we've are we all been at each other's weddings and stood up at each other's weddings and godfathered each other's kids and been through each other's traumas and, and, um, and still speak weekly. So it's, 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 it's very special. And I get, without getting too emotional and too cornball about it I think we all value each other as our as our closest friends and that's I think that's caught on film and I think it's one of the reasons that Star Trek next generation anyway has been so successful because the camera somehow sees that these people like each other not only these characters I, I believe I really believe that that's true <laughs> <laughs>